Hello and welcome to Globcom here from Germany. Thank you for tuning in. My name is Daniel Silberhorn and I'm the Globcom lecturer here in Germany at Erfurt University and I'm also a senior PR consultant at Fleischmann Hillert in Germany focusing on corporate communications and sustainability. And I've prepared a little topic for you, which I find intriguing, and I do hope you enjoy it as well. So, hello. First of all, I would like you to take a second uh, to think, what is the biggest challenge of our time? Many or most of you will have thought COVID-19. Who thought COVID-19? Others may have thought climate change. Who thought climate change? Interestingly, in the public debate, these two crises are being linked. In what way? If you look at this, this is a headline from mid-April where CEOs, trade unions, politicians, and think tanks called for a so-called green recovery or to build back better. The thought is that with economy being down now, when you throw on the engine again, we should make it in a way that considers the environment. As you can see here in the quote, uh, we should withstand the temptations of short-term solutions in response to the present crisis that risk locking the EU in a fossil fuel economy for decades to come. And interestingly, and this is what my talk is about, uh, there are a few lessons which you can take for solving the climate crisis by looking at the COVID-19 pandemic. Thinking about it and our communication around it, um, I see five factors that influence effective communication. And from that, I will derive a few uh, lessons and recommendations for the climate communication. First of all, if you look at the two crises we mentioned, of course, you know from your everyday lives um, how serious the impact is of the lockdown, of the travel bans and all that. And of course, um, that's reflected in a, in a major scale on the global economy as well. Here are two graphics. Uh, one is where you can see the development of the oil price. And you see that uh, for the first time ever, oil prices in the US uh, went negative. So technically, when you wanted to sell uh, oil, you had to pay for getting rid of it. And the graph next to it, this is uh, the development of the stock markets. Japan, US, UK, you see massive dips there of up to minus 35% um, at the end of March. And this is of course not just on a, on a big level of the economy, but of course you feel it on the everyday level of people as well. Here we can see uh, on the left-hand side that uh, this is the development of people in the US filing for uh, unemployment benefits because they lost their jobs. And you can see the jump uh, in March from somewhere below 500,000 to suddenly uh, three point something and even up to 6.8 million um, at the end of March, uh, early April. This is a huge impact too. And this is not just the US, of course. Yeah, it's reflected all over the world. Here to the right-hand side, you see the um, estimated annual cross-domestic product, Canada, China, France, Germany, Italy, Japan, UK, US again, you name it. We are all taking a big hit in takes of the economy. And all of that, because we accepted the lockdown rules and the changes that were imposed on ourselves and on the economy. So what is re really remarkable about this? Hello to people in Australia who will know uh, the rocks here, the remarkables. 
uh, it was remarkable that uh, in this case, governments more or less listened to science. Of course, there were differences between the US and Singapore and all the countries in between. But still, there was, uh, there was evidence, there was uh, scientists saying, uh, this is what we should do, and governments reacted. People in the everyday streets, uh, they accepted traumatic cuts of freedom, even stayed at home. I do know uh, that you, uh, dear friends in, um, uh, in Spain, for example, uh, that, is, that are only a few hours per day when you leave, when you can leave your home, depending on the age group you have. So we really uh, turn our life upside down. And um, at least in the first part of the pandemic, uh, many people even acted, acted as multipliers of the message. So there are even big multinational companies like Mercedes who changed their advertising to reinforce the message, message what we should do on the ground as people. It is changing now because the situation is changing. But for the first part, that is what I found really remarkable. Big cuts, big limitations, but people accepted and complied and even talked about it further. Now, if we look to the other crisis, like climate change, there are, of course, various uh, calculations. <clears throat> For example, um, there's a study uh, looking into what happens if global temperatures rose by 2.8 degrees Celsius or even by 4.5 degrees Celsius by 2100? And the reasons of the effects, of course, are uh, what we see uh, um, as a result of climate change, uh, warmer water temperatures, uh, warmer temperatures in general, sea level rise, extreme weather, and all the stuff that I put down here, damage to property, infrastructure, demand for energy increases, and also those things. But I want to draw your attention to now is, um, this graphic here. In the bad case, worst case scenario, when we think that by 2100, the global average temperatures have risen to 4.5 degrees Celsius, this would mean an annual loss of 520 billion US dollars per year globally. This is a huge amount of money. And even in the 2.8 degrees Celsius uh, situation, we would still lose 296 billion US dollars per year. And uh, just as a comparison, how big these uh, figures are, um, the US has a cross domestic product uh, every year of 20.5 billion US dollar. So you can do the maths how many uh, years of US GDP that is. And you could even argue that um, seeing the, the, the costs for, for the corona crisis we mentioned before, um, you could argue that within eight years, only eight years, that cost would be exceeded if we have the worst case scenario of 4.5 degrees Celsius uh, of global temperature rise. And the thing is, here is how it looked like in the last year in terms of temperatures. 2019 was the warmest year on record. At present, we are at 1.15 degrees Celsius uh, global temperature rise, 1.15. And it's still quite a few years to go to 2100. Uh, the animation here shows the, um, how the uh, temperatures deviated from the average uh, temperature uh, before industrialization. And we go, as you go through the months, every jump in the, uh, in the graphic is a new month of 2019 what we see is that there's a lot of red. Red meaning uh, it's above the former uh, average. There's also a bit of blue, which is below the former average, but you can see it's been hot really everywhere, all year round, much warmer than it used to be. And the thing is, it's not just one year. You can see the development over uh, the decades. 
starting at 1880 at the far left. And as you go towards the right, you reach uh, the more recent years and you can see there's unfortunately a clear tendency. So you can imagine how the impact on the economy develops. But luckily, there are also opportunities in positive climate action. So we have various reports on that, of course. So one says, as, it put, as I put down here, if we uh, invest 1.8 trillion by 2030, uh, that's what you might have to do, but payoffs could be four times that figures. Or another study found um, that the investments required might create an average of 550,000 uh, jobs over that same time. And it would actually help to save 78 billion US dollar. So huge negative impact if we fail to do something, but a positive potential uh, outcome if we do something as a society, as people, as economy. Now, what is remarkable here it is a very different story than what I showed to you uh, for COVID-19. Here, for decades, many governments rejected science. Yeah? We know since 1972 um, the, the limits of growth and the progress of global initiatives has also been rather slow. So just at the end of last year in Madrid, um, the UN climate conference, many were really uh, disappointed by the results of it. And still, also in everyday lives, in my life, your life, our, um, the life of all of us, most people choose personal freedom over the planet. Be it um, big cars, big traveling, be it waste, whatever. Many, many, many people do not change anything about their daily life. And now that is something very different, right? To the situation we had with COVID-19. And that is very strange because what we have is uh, two different crises. Both are very serious and we have two ways of handling them. COVID-19, People listen to science, governments act, people um, comply. Then we have the climate crisis, where this is not really happening or at a much slower pace. And the question now really is, why is that? How can it be? Two situations, both have really big effects on us, but people behave in a different manner. Looking at the story, I saw five key factors which I would like to present to you. Closeness, complexity, manageability, time frame, and alternatives. So moving to the first one, closeness. Of course, you know that things that happen far away or remain very abstract touch us much less than what happens uh, near to us or that has a bigger effect on us. Uh, with COVID-19, every new infection was counted. It originated most likely in China, as far as we know, and we could actually observe the virus uh, coming towards us on the world map. It's about the here and it's about the now. Uh, and the effects are in fact about us, our friends and our parents uh, who may not be able to get a bed in the intensive care unit uh, if we infect them and if the virus spread it too fast. And one thing that was really key for politicians to act, at least in the opinion of some, and I think there's something to it, uh, what we do now results in potential loss of life. Tomorrow, it's not just a generation away or two generations away, but, but now. And also, it's not the same um, uh, group who's really uh, speaking out or in, who, who says, hey, we are threatened. 
it's not some kids who are um, affected, like with Greta Thunberg and uh, all the young kids on the streets. But the risk group actually consists of today's conservative voters. And I'm sure that will have made uh, a few politicians move a bit more than actually they might have done in other cases. Then here, um, then climate change, on the other hand, um, seemed quite different. Um, melting polar caps, hungry polar bears, such phenomena um, are far away. And it's only uh, experiences uh, which we had last year, such as the heat records of 2019, that it became clear it's really coming closer to us. It's about our generation. It's not the next one. It's about you. So basically, really, the window of opportunity to do something and the need for action have moved right into the present. This is also one of the reasons why uh, the uh, climate movement has gained traction last year. Because more and more, the consequences are being felt at home, not far away. That is the first factor. If we move to the second one, complexity. In the case of the coronavirus, uh, the cause for the crisis is pretty obvious. It's a single virus. It has a clear geographic origin and the risk is also clear. The faster and the wider COVID-19 spreads, the more difficult uh, it is to control the consequences. If we expose ourselves, we are at risk. Uh, in climate change, there it looks again quite different. We have many factors that play a role and they are linked together because uh, the warming of a sea uh, in one part of our world will have an effect on ice on the other end of the world, for example. And the thing is, only in recent years, and maybe sometimes also just now, we are only beginning to understand all the interrelationships and interactions. I mean, for example, we do know the Amazon rainforest as the green lung of our Earth. Yeah, it's hugely important for the well-being of all of us. However, there is a development underway that may change the Amazon rainforest from a CO2 sink. I mean, that that took in carbon dioxide or takes in to a potential CO2 source. Uh, that is very surprising. And such effects only develop over years and decades and in a network that's really uh, difficult to understand. And similarly complex and diverse are also the aspects in our lives which we have to question. Are the consequences that individuals can very easily feel powerless because what can I do? I'm just one person. And it's always easy to argue that other areas seem to be much more relevant. Take flying, for example. Some people say, oh, that accounts only for 2.5% of CO2 emissions, which is true, but it's also in an area of the atmosphere um, that can be very easily damaged, for example. Or Germany's share of global two, uh, CO2 emissions is barely 2% compared to China's 27.5%. So you can always point to other areas where things should happen first. Complexity paralyzes action and outsources responsibility and initiative into a diffuse social cloud. The third factor is manageability. In the complexity of climate change, uh, the options for action are quite difficult for individuals to grasp. It is a question of consumption, of leisure time, of food, of mobility. All areas of life are touched because they do have an influence. So where to start and where to stop? The gap between sustainable values and real action is often wide. 
not least because good behavior, such as waste avoidance, initially means more effort. Where can I find a packaging-free shop? Where is a second-hand shop for business clothing and all that thing? So it takes an effort. In addition, many climate protesters uh, protect us uh, calling for the great transformation, saying we have to change our lives completely and fundamentally. This may be true, of course, for society especially. But in individual cases, it very often leads to people feeling overwhelmed. Because what can I do so much? Or just as critically, climate-friendly action is seen as meaning less of what I like, less comfort, less luxury. The key word here is sufficiency. We should be satisfied with less. Planetary desirable action is wrongly seen as a Trojan horse for less quality of life due to such communication. In uh, the COVID-19 case, official communication shows a clear path of action. Everyone knows what they can do. Wash your hands, maintain general hygiene, keep your distance from other people. The obvious message is keep your distance, slow down the virus, flatten the curve. So it's really a manageable number of behavior patterns that are communicated over and over again and hopefully lead to a result that is clearly desirable. This is simple and it only hurts potentially for a more or less short time. Because later, sometime, uh, our life will be back to normal in one way or the other. So that's the next factor. Here's the fourth one, time frame. As we just said, um, the anti-corona measures intervene drastically into everyday life. But everyone knows the situation is temporary, especially now with the easing of measures and lockdown stops happening these days and these weeks. So at some point, we know the whole thing will be over. So now eyes closed and let's get through this together. In the very first days, um, uh, I saw many memes with the, uh, with the lines, your parents were asked to go to war. You are being asked to sit on the couch. We can do this. The problem has an expiration date. Climate change is again a different story. We do realize that to maintain a comfortable climate for us, for human beings, change must be permanent. So for example, it's not enough to just leave the car uh, in the garage for a couple of weeks. Indeed, we need to think about uh, mobility as a whole. Um, new concepts. How can we be mobile uh, in a way that uh, is not destroying the climate too much? Interestingly, here you can see the effects uh, of changed behavior on the climate. Because right now, as you know, because of COVID-19, we have less busy roads, quieter city centers, and less pollution. In China, for example, pollution went down 25%. So this shows again that action does have an effect. In climate change, however, for the long term, it is a matter of finding a new balance. It's real change. We don't like that. We don't like real change as humans. So here again is uh, an estimation uh, global CO2 emissions. And what you see here, the blue line is the, the, the growth of CO2 emissions worldwide since 1900. And the red dot, which is well below the line, shows an estimate for 2020 carbon dioxide. The last factor 
which I want to talk about is uh, alternatives. With COVID-19, uh, the options were quite clear, at least at the start. Now it's getting more complicated, or it is more complicated now. At the start, in the first few weeks, everybody knows um, it's about uh, flattening the curve. And everybody knows the flatten the curve graph. This is a very crucial instrument in the whole communication. And if you Google it, you will find it dozens and hundreds of times adapted across all channels. What it does show, you know that of course, uh, two options. One, no measures against Corona with measures is uh, the other line. In the first case, our healthcare system will not be able to handle the situation. With measures, we can keep the curve below the horizontal line that represent the capacity. The statement again here is very clear. If we gain time, we will manage. Flatten the curve is the mission that is plausible or was plausible to many. It was clear to us that we have a choice between acting restrictively now and a near future that could become difficult for many without action. Climate change, of course, also has iconic images, be it Greta uh, Thunberg uh, with her sign, sled dogs apparently walking on water, uh, or satellite images of forest fires in the Amazon, or the fires in Australia. And there also are some horizontal lines, for example, Rockstrom's uh, planetary boundaries, or the two degree uh, climate target formulated in the 1970s and others. But these lines do not con connect consequences of human action with climate. And those, uh, they do not offer any action motivating catchy images. There is no easy to understand graph that links behavior and desired climate future. Attempts have been made to use the flatten the curve uh, graph also for climate change. You can see it here. Business as usual, loads of climate risk. The blue um, area is um, if we take climate action, the climate risk will be much lower. And there's also um, one version uh, that is trying to say the danger is real big. Yeah. So uh, no, in the case of no measures taken, we will not just uh, go over the Earth's capacity, but it's really, the risk is really uh, going through the roof. So uh, the pledge is, let's flatten this curve too. But honestly, I'm not sure if that will work as the flatten the curve is uh, too clearly linked to, um, to uh, the uh, COVID pandemic. And uh, using that image is too clearly linked to uh, objectives of, um, of one group. And I think um, the climate change will need its own graphic to really work. If you Google this graphics, uh, it will be much harder to find. So you can see from the impact already, it's not working in the same way. All right. So we looked into um, the two crises with, its, with their huge consequences. And we did identify differences in how government and people deal with it. And we have looked at factors that influence um, why this is the case. So what can we learn for a climate change communication? The thing is, to sum that up again, uh, despite all the dire consequences, during the first weeks in countries uh, like Germany, uh, the corona crisis seems to have been perceived through a lens of a certain manageability compared to climate change. Lower complexity, manageable options, defined time horizon, 
and clearly presented alternatives. What you can learn from this is, I think, uh, one thesis um, on an individual level, uh, while we still need to speak about how big the danger is uh, globally and with governments and all that, but on individual levels, when you talk to regular people, society at large, I do think that effective communication must transport climate change in a way that, it, that makes it uh, manageable or makes it seem manageable in everyday life, that you can actually deal with it. What we often see is a very uh, apocalyptic communication. If we don't do something now, we will all be dead tomorrow uh, along these lines. Um, but people get used to that. They hear that for a long time or others may not be ready to listen to it at all because it threatens their life so they don't want to see it. And there's also a lot of appealing to reason using facts and figures and science. But these two approaches will only get you uh, this far. It may be ignored and will only motivate a few potentially. So what you need to do is you also talk, have to talk to people's hearts. Yeah? If we want to make a difference, we also must answer the question that really drives everyone. What's in it for me? Yeah? For, a lot, for a long time, the consequences of climate change were just something very distant, something for the future generations. We have to speak about what does it mean for me now? And um, here we need to be careful uh, that we frame an action for climate, not as something where we lose something, but it should be framed as, um, as a matter of what we gain. It's about bringing positive effects into the personal present. One example, last year to Globcom, uh, I took the night train from Frankfurt via France, uh, through Spain to Lisbon. If you just say the train takes, I don't know, 24 hours or something like that, people will go, oh no, flying is so much shorter and uh, less expensive even. Uh, I don't want that. But if you tell people about the sort of adventure you have, I mean, it's just awesome to sit uh, on the night train, have a candle, have wine, uh, look outside as the night is chasing by, suddenly it becomes an adventure and it adds quality of life instead of just looking at the lost time um, you had to invest. Uh, so it needs to be about bringing positive effects into the personal present, as I said. And also it's important to make it as easy as possible to act in a climate-friendly way. Or as uh, Nudge theory says, a certain behavior becomes more likely the more convenient it is to realize. If you place litter bins in a very visible way, people will use them more just because they see them. Or if you put up signs where to put which waste, people will separate the waste because they uh, see how it works and people usually want to do uh, the right thing. So there's a chance really to tap into uh, current trends like uh, slowing down, health, mindfulness, uh, and all these current trends offer the big chance to communicate uh, climate protection on a personal level as a gain in quality of life. The big task also becomes more manageable through defining intermediate steps resulting from the overarching uh, positive vision. Even if everything basically should happen at once, we can't handle the big thing at the same time. We need small things that are achievable so we can tick a box at the end of the day where can tap our shoulders and say, oh, and today I've, something, I've done something good. Yeah. I, I took the train. I, I don't know. I prevented waste and all that. So we need to have small steps. And we could use um, big data to show how individual actions do add up to clear effects on the climate and on quality of life. So one example is... Um, 
that brings personal gain and personal effects in the present together with the bigger uh, overarching issue of climate change um, is uh, the so-called planetary health diet. The figure you see uh, below the graph is 37% uh, of emissions are due to our food system. The way we produce food, uh, what we consume, meat, dairy and all that, uh, how, it's, um, how it's processed, how it's distributed and how food is wasted. Uh, that, all of that results uh, into 37% into of CO2 emissions uh, worldwide. And what we have here in the graphic um, is what the planetary health diet promotes. It promotes eating habits that are healthier for the planet and for people. You can still see uh, dairy foods, it's the blue part. You can still see meat, it's the red part. Yeah? You don't have to fully give up things that you know are bad in a certain way. You can still eat meat, you can still eat cheese, but just less of it and more other stuff. The big green part on the left-hand side, that's all the veggies. Of course, we all do know we should do that. And we all do know that there's something to be said about uh, eating vegan. But if you frame it like this, it's much more doable. It's much easier than to go completely vegan. It's concrete as well. And it does have an impact. And it does come with a good feeling of acting in a better way. So all this is what we can learn from the COVID-19 crisis for climate change communication. The bottom line is, uh, it is not only about less of the bad, bad for the planet, but it's above all about more of the good for human beings, for quality of life, for fellow people, and for the planet. This is an important switch of perspective. So what can we, what can you do? I spoke a lot about uh, what I think and shared those thoughts. And I do hope uh, you did find them interesting. We looked at the seriousness of the corona and the climate change crisis. We identified five factors of effective communication in comparing the two challenges. And I presented what I think can be learned for effective climate change communication. Here is the part about what every one of us can do. And you might expect me to tell you what that is now. After all, I am a lecturer and you have joined Clubcom as students. But I tell you what, I will not tell you what I think you should do. Rather, I will ask you, what do you want to do? Because here's the thing, you are getting ready to play your part in society and you will increasingly make decisions, small and big, for you, for others, for all of us. From this point on, your impact will grow also upon society. And you will be in charge of all of this when us lecturers are retired. So what do you want to do as individuals, as communicators, as members of the global community, not as Clubcom? So I would like you to please have a little think about that, what you wanna do. And please, if you can, and if you want, do leave a comment below the video for the others to see, for everyone to take inspiration. And let's do something together for our joint world and for all, all of us who live in it. And now I wish you wonderful, inspiring, interesting hours with the Clubcom Symposium. Thank you very much for tuning in. Thank you very much for listening. I wish you a very, 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 very good time. Stay safe, stay healthy. Thank you. Bye-bye.